What is the oldest currency still in use? Is the question that I will answer by the end of the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of The More You Know Mondays. The more you know, the more you grow. And this week on the show, I will be talking about step in fetch it. Or maybe I should call it that I'm talking about Lincoln Perry. Because that's the actor behind the character of step in fetch it. But I'll get into that in a minute in a bit. But before I get into that, you know what I have to do. We have to start the show with some positive vibes, with some positive Monday affirmations. And I do that in the form of a quote. And this week is unlike any other week. And this week's quote is by uh, James Jameson Ferguson. And it goes like this. Don't look at Monday morning just as another day that you must go back to work. Be thankful that you have a job to go to so you can provide for yourself and just be thankful that you got to wake up. Now, I like this quote um, because maybe not so much the first part because we're in a global pandemic at this moment in time. um, But then it, it still does equate to me because right now in life, unfortunately, because all I do is work like work is basically my social life um i have home life and i have work life there's no other life outside of it so for me it can get into a rut of or for most people who are still working right now the nine to five monday to friday um like you might have the weekend off but then you're back at work on monday and like that sleep on sunday night just feels like you could do with like a whole extra day for the weekend like if there was three days of the weekend it would just be perfect because you know you could have those two days where you could be crazy and then you could just have this last day where you could just literally chill which probably wouldn't work out like that it would just go into like or become just another day that you could work you know um but in an ideal world in my head that sounds like it would make sense also, I think that another thing that we should all be thankful for is the fact that we do wake up every morning that, you know, it, 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 it might not be the biggest thing to be happy about, but, but I think it's a, a thing that you should be thankful for waking up every morning. Um, not that everyone doesn't, but you know, it, it might not be a thing that happens every day or maybe tomorrow you won't wake up not that i'm wishing it on anyone but i'm just saying the days that you do wake up you should be thankful for because those are days that you get to experience something new but saying that or in saying that i know that nowadays right now we're kind of in lockdown so experiencing something new is kind of on a minimum but then at the same time you need to be thankful for the little things because the little things are the only things that you can really appreciate right now because you can't really get to experience anything outside of yourself and your home life so be thankful for what you have around you and your support system um and be thankful that they're there for you and that you get to wake up every morning to experience another day of your life. And I've been thinking about this for a while recently in the sense that it feels like the world has kind of changed completely overnight. And it, in, a, in a way, it feels like we're, we've been just forced to adjust to it, like just like a snap of a finger as if that was always our life 
which is why I, I guess this whole lockdown experience it feels like uh, an experiment more than an experience if I want to think about it really in a, in a real sense it feels like a real experiment that's happening like let's see what it feels like if we just lock them down <laughs> that's probably sound hella like conspiracy theory but I'm gonna go with it for a second like wh- what would it be like if if we just locked them down like we said there was this virus we we set out a virus you know it's killing people so like it makes sense so what we locked them down and then you know we have to figure out a cure for this thing so we have to keep them contained for longer and you know before we know it maybe we'll just see how far we can push people before they actually explode or just completely comply i don't know sounds like a crazy thought but it's something an idea that's gone through my head it could be a sci- sci-fi novel <laughs> maybe um but you know, it is it would be interesting to look into or write a story about it. But I, again, gone off in a tangent and moved away from my original point. So if I was to sum up this quote into real plain text as opposed to going off on tangents as I have been before, I feel like it means that we should be thankful for every day as it comes because we get to live it and enjoy it and be in the moment of it like there's not much that you uh, achieve if you constantly live in the past or you constantly looking for the future because the past has already happened so it's not something that can be changed so only thing you can do is live in the now to see what you can do now to improve what you did in the past and the future hasn't even happened yet so you're worrying about it as easy as as easy as it is for me to say is kind of like it's something that you can't you have no control over unless you affect your now because what you do in the now affects your future but (laughs) that's how i see it anyway so be thankful for every day that you wake up and don't see monday morning as such a chore as more of another day that you get to wake up and enjoy life as what it is throwing at us at this moment in time. And I think that's a crucial part of the whole puzzle piece in the fact of, although we're in lockdown right now, I don't think it's, I don't think, (laughs) it's not going to be something that will go on forever. There will be a light, because if we look at like Australia right now, they're living life that everyone's out there partying and whatnot and they're they're um existing in what we used to experience or know as normal as opposed to this lockdown lifestyle but there is a light at the end of the tunnel so take every day as it comes and hope for a better future but the only person that can be in control of your future is you so do something now that can change your tomorrow otherwise every day that you're not doing it is a day wasted i just watched this (laughs) motivational video i think it just said that in the video that i was watching (laughs) but it's true Every day that you're not doing the thing that you're think constantly thinking about and trying to plan for is a day wasted on the day that you're not doing it. So not to say that you shouldn't plan, because obviously you should plan, but still, just think about it. <laughs> but anyway, let's get on with the show. Let's start talking about Lincoln Perry, or as he's most famously known as or known by uh, with his character, which is Step and Fetch It. So, Lincoln Theodore Monroe Andrew Perry was born on May the 30th, 1902. 
and died on November the 19th, 1985. So he lived a very long life. Now, he is better known for by his stage name, which is Stepin Fetcher. And his char- the character that he played is very, I guess, from my research, it seems like he's a very controversial um, black actor of the time in the sense of the character that he played was basically... He had, uh, Stepin Fetchett had the persona of the laziest man in the world. Um, because he played this, I guess, what, what can I call it? Like kind of a, a stereotypical, um, I don't want to, yeah, a stereotype of what we see as the bad qualities of what it is to be a black person. Um, lazy, um, uneducated all these bad connotations are the is was what was built into the character that uh lincoln perry played when he played the character of step and fetch it step and fetch it rather but another thing that i think we need to understand also at the time is he when he became popular was in the probably in the 1930s so this was still in the time of jim crow law and everything like that so although he may have been playing this character it was i guess in a sense the the only roles that were really available in hollywood for a black actor at the time lincoln perry has been coined as the as becoming the first black actor to earn one million dollars um he is also the first black actor to who to receive a feature screen credit in a film but let's start at the beginning so little is kind of known about his background completely other than the fact that he was born in key west florida um to west indian immigrant parents um he was the second child of joseph perry who was a cigar maker from jamaica or possibly the bahamas and his mother dora monroe was a seamstress who was also from the bahamas and they moved to america the united states in 18 or in the 1890s um where they were married and then there isn't much else that's really of interest about his childhood other than the fact of when he was about 14 years old he left home and joined medicine shows minstrel shows and the carnivals um where he would perform in Venderville shows as a dancer, singer, and comedian. So he then adopted his stage name, which he is known to or known of now, uh, Stepin Fetcher, who, which he says that he got from the name of a racehorse that he had bet on and the jockeys. Uh, is it called the jockeys i think it's called the jockeys uh, down at the racetrack <laughs> so basically the name originates from a um a joint show that uh, lincoln Fe- uh, lincoln ferry lincoln perry and his partner had a comedy team up or comedy duo which was named step and fetch it so it's kind of said that when the act that Perry was a part of with his partner eventually became a solo act, he adopted from that name Step, Step in, Fetch It, and became, that became his professional name, his performer name. And which is the character in which he played 
which is rather a controversial figure, I guess, in history and also in cinema for, for black people more than anything in the sense that it perpetuated, um, an image of what black people might be like to a, a white world. And I say that in the sense of if, if you're thinking about the 1930s, and Jim Crow law and segregation, then there wasn't many black figures that were on the mainstream media in TV or film. And thinking about it on the flip, that although he was playing this, this character, which is deemed as this lazy, uh, uneducated version of a black person which is so held holds such negative connotations the reason why it's probably still seen or in screen today or more than anything or why it's maybe the image of the stereotype of what um people have of black people is or of what i thought is just because at the time of him being so popular and him being the only one in all of these popular roles there probably wasn't many he was probably more in in white cinema so there wasn't probably many black people not that there wasn't probably many black people but that i was just thinking in the sense of not many black people that would have watched it i mean there would have been more white people that would have watched this and see not known any black people personally and just made the assumption that oh because it's in the cinema and this is now a representation of um a black person for us or for them they would they would unknowingly create some sort of stereotype as to oh because he is being portrayed this way in the film and i don't know any and they don't know any person they don't personally know any black people then they can make the assumption that all black people are like that because that's the the image that they are being given that's the stereotype that they're being presented with which is like Nowadays, when you, you'll see, uh, for me anyway, I'll see a strong black, um, lead in a film or a TV show. And I'm just like, yo, this is dope. Like I look up to that, but th thinking back, I thinking back to the 1930s, the reason why, or even in the 1930s, as his career, his career kind of died towards an end of the 1930s, kind of end of 39, um, because, of how people were seeing the character or how black people were seeing the character of step and fetch it and this these bad horrible not horrible i guess negative connotations that were being uh perpetuated out there for the i guess the white narrative which i kind of say with like a grain of salt in the sense of that was back then we've come so far now like that i guess the narrative is changing but it wasn't as such back then so in a way it's as if step and fetch it had to kind of swallow his own pride and play characters that he may not have agreed with but because of him it opened up the doors for black people in the cinema or in tv or in mainstream media so i read this interesting part uh, through in my research that said that while he was going um to auditions um before and after he would stay in the character of step and fetch it and there would be times where he would maybe skip or mumble lines that he didn't like, uh, pretending to be stupid and, or not being able to comprehend the script. And 
they laughed at it. They thought it was funny that this he he didn't get it. That, that they generally believed it, but he was playing this character almost in the sense I kind of connect it to. If you look at it in modern day, that it's it's very much seen in maybe in the character or in the characters that Sasha Bar- Sasha Baron Cohen plays, um, like when he as an actor is Sasha Baron Cohen, but he played Borat in a multi- in a number of films. Back in the day, he was Ali G. Um, he's done Bruno and, and all these controversial characters that he's played. And in a way, it kind of allows you to... Maybe it's an unpopular opinion, but it, it allows you to step away from the character and kind of look at it from an objective point of view if that kind of makes any sense in the sense of he was doing what he could in a way it's kind of like looking at it like you do whatever you you do whatever you can or you do whatever it takes to get yourself in the place that you want to be so sometimes you to become the CEO of a company, this is a crazy, uh, maybe comparison, but to be a CEO of the company, maybe you have to first work in the mail room and deliver people's mail. And then you work your way up and suddenly you're a receptionist or you're a personal assistant. And then after becoming a personal assistant, you become a vice president. And after becoming a vice president, president so, um it's like you become a partner and it's like before you can get to this this level of high esteem sometimes you have to shovel shovel for uh, shovel and wade through the rubbish to get to to the point of success and maybe it sounds or seems a bit fickle in any way, but I'm trying to rationalize the mind of this, this person who lived in such a segregated world, but managed to become the first black actor to make a million dollars. Now back in, that's like almost 1930s. So, that's like 50 50 what am i talking about that's like 90 about 90 years ago like that's almost 100 years ago and if you think about how crazy it is that the world has changed so much pretty much in the last how long have we been in lockdown the last year like it's changed dramatically think about how much the world has changed in the last 100 years so in the time when he was living i feel like it's although he was playing such a negative connotated character which is why it's so controversial he kind of waded through the rubbish so that black actors of today black comedians of today could be seen in a better light but that's not to say that we don't still face adversity now a hundred years on from that but i guess it's kind of still getting better slowly day by day but anyway uh lincoln perry arrived in hollywood in the late 1920s where he made a big impression The first movie that he made, uh, using the name Step and Fetch It, was an, was MGM's In Old Kentucky, which was filmed in 1929. And this was the film in which, while reading the script, um, he found 
a few of the lines quite offensive. So that's why he would skip or mumble the lines like he was kind of pretending that he was stupid or he didn't get what the script was saying, which kind of solidified this kind of stereotype, which was already perpetuated or being pe- perpetuated from the Jim Crow, the Jim Crow ruling. So I think it's also important to say that kind of, although Step and Fetch is such a controversial character because of the character um, that he played, it's also important to know that he wasn't, it's not like he created this character. Although he did create the character of Step and Fetch it, this idea um, was already apparent in uh, popular mediums. So he was kind of, I guess, making a comment and joke on the fact of people thinking this. But, I mean, again, that's my interpretation of everything. Thinking about this in kind of another sense, it it brings on or coins kind of something that one of my friends was saying to me recently in the sense of he said that people you kind of seem to find that people who have gone through a lot of stuff they have the darkest sense of humor so i'm not sure if that's any of that's connected but maybe somewhat that is a level of the humor it's it's morbid because of the character that it perpetuates, but then at the same time, those were the only roles that were available for him to apply for. So whether he was offended by what he was reading or offended by the roles that he had to play, for him to become one of the best screen and and screen actors and comedians even reaching the top billing status with other actors such as will rogers and shirley temple he he had to play the roles that were available for black actors and like my mum always says when you play something or when you do something you do it to the best of your ability and your, I guess your talents will shine through. And no one can negate his talent, but it's just the fact of the character, which is of Step and Fetching, which is so controversial. So, like most, I don't know, like most, but like, like anyone who starts with nothing and now has millions of dollars him becoming the first millionaire i'm sure in with inflation and everything nowadays that would be that million would be much worth much more but with his him becoming a millionaire he maintained his expensive life style (laughs) with um, him buying and living in a very large house. I assume it would be in a mansion or something. He had 12 cars, one which included a pink's, a, a pink's, a pink Rolls Royce. And he also kept a staff of 16 Chinese servants. Um, I mean, most rich people that I see in TV shows and movies, uh, I've recently been watching this series called um dynasty and even in their house in rich people they have i don't want to call them servants but they have um what can you call them uh people that look after the house for them they have people to cook for them this is like the life of a rich person or the life of someone who lives a lavish life where they have a lot of money you see it's common where they don't do much for themselves because they don't have to. They can pay someone else to do it for them. Um, but yeah. 
I guess they are servants because they, they work for him, but it is what it is. So he appeared in about 50, sorry, not 50, over 50 films altogether. He starred in about over 50 movies and he probably uh, in the 19, in the mid 1930s, with him becoming the first million, uh, a first black actor to become a millionaire, he appeared in 44 films between 1927 and 1939, which is kind of the years where his career took a kind of a, a spitfalling spin spiral down in the sense of him in i think it was 1940 perry temporarily temporarily <laughs> temporarily stopped appearing in films because he was frustrated with the fact of he was making multiple attempts for there to be equal pay and billing um between uh, uh white actors and black actors he 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 was fighting for this and with it being so unsuccessful in all those years where he was performing and appearing in movies he decided to just i guess leave hollywood for a couple of years i say a couple of years because he returned in 1945 um probably out of financial needs because if you think about it he was making a lot of his money from the films and it seems like he was the type of person to spend that money as soon as it hit his account <laughs> so maybe four or five years was all that he could handle with there being no constant income he had enough money to last him for five years but then his accountant was just like look if you continue like this spending that money as soon as it comes in you're gonna need to swallow your pride and start working again which is what he did though he only appeared in about eight films between 1945 and 1953 so if you think about it but he had kind of lost his i guess popularity his momentum he appeared in 44 films in 10 years compared to the 10 years where after he took a break where he only appeared in eight sorry he only yeah he only appeared in eight films that's like a huge drastic change and in 1947 he declared himself as bankrupt so the, the fact of him only being in eight films it, it it goes to say it goes to show that he was still trying to he was in his mind he still had the same amount like he was spending the money as soon as it came in so he he could he could sustain it before because the ask for him to be in films was much higher he was making all that he was in 44 films in 10 years he had he was balling for those years but then after that he took a break and he it was down I, th I think it was more down for his morals he he didn't want to work for less pay than his white counterparts in the fact of he was doing just as good as just just as good a, a work or a job in his role as they were in their role and he believed that we, he should be paid the same as them but unfortunately the hollywood at the time didn't agree with him so he was now less popular than before and making less money after 1953 it was mainly cameos where step and fetch it would appear in films such as uh, the feature film amazing grace in 1974 and one ton the dog who saved hollywood i was about to say christmas <laughs> no one ton the dog that saved hollywood which came out in 1976 um unfortunately 
around this point, he found himself in conflict during his career, especially with civil rights um, leaders who criticized the persona that he was playing in films that he that he was portraying of black people uh which he is still cr- heavily criticized for nowadays um eh, for especially like in what was the year in 1968 CBS aired an hour long documentary which was called Black History Lost Stolen or Strayed um it was written by Andy Rooney uh which he received the Emmy for and the show was the sorry the documentary was narrated by Bill Cosby who criticized the depiction of black americans um in films Especially, he singled out Step and Fetch It for criticisms um, on the character that he created. Although, I, like I said, it, I, I've got my words now, <laughs> uh, and I looked into it a bit, a little bit more. It's kind of like when I said, like, for the vision of like white people in the sense of minstrel shows, if anyone's aware of that happened were basically white actors in blackface um performing in this stereotypical image of what they saw a black person to be like so then the character of step and fetch it is kind of a spin on the minstrel show but then kind of continuing the stereotype as opposed to trying to change it which is why i think it would be seen as so controversial although then it it was also a character that many people loved and a lot of people hated so I guess it was a type of thing where he made a choice. And it's one of those choices in life where you can't please everyone. But I guess he pleased himself and his pockets. But on a deeper level, it's kind of a thing where... <sighs> like I said, in Hollywood at the time, those were the roles that were available so he took it and although in the character of step and fetch it he played he wore oversized clothes and his eyes were always wide open and he had this perpetual grin on his face all the time and probably he shuffled when he walked it was all stereotypes and this (laughs) This idea of, I guess, selling out um, is is used a lot. You you see, or a lot of people feel like they have to, to further their popularity, they have to make sacrifices on maybe what they believe themselves, but it's for them to get to a point where they can then change and lead in a better way. Um, not everyone believes that they have to do it this way, but a lot of people, it, it has been popularized because you do see it in the mainstream media. There's all these conspiracies about how celebrities made it to where they are and what they're doing. And, you know, and, but, I guess, like I said, it's a choice that you have to make. If you believe that this is the way that you have to do it to get to a better point, then by all means, but there are always other ways at the same time. Uh, Personally, I'm not sure 100% if I love or 100% hate it, 
but I can f- understand the what can I call it the struggles of the time and also what it might have not uh, maybe not understand I think empathize is probably the better word but in his legacy step and fetch it has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and in 1976 despite the popular adversary or adversions to the character of step and fetch it uh, the Hollywood chapter of the NACP awarded um, Lincoln Perry a special NAACP Image Award. And two years later, he was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. So that's where I will leave it with Step and Fetch It, Lincoln Perry. And... Please do look more into this man's interesting life. Um, Because although it's very controversial, I somewhat believe that his efforts paved the way for what we are now able to appreciate and see in cinema in Hollywood in a better light in the looks of if we think of like black panther and uh chadwick boseman or denzel washington eddie murphy like all these greats dave chappelle is another person that kind of comes to mind in this same kind of controversial kind of light because there's parts of lincoln perry in all of them um, but yeah, th- this, that's my opinion, my outside look. Um, but I promised an answer to the question. And th- what is the oldest currency still in use? Well, some of you might be surprised to hear this, but the British pound, pound sterling, is the world's oldest currency which is still in use it's probably about 1200 years old and it dates back to the anglo-saxon times the pound has gone through many changes before evolving into the currency that we recognize today but the facts still remain that although it wasn't the first currency in the world the first currency in the world it was from like nearly 700 years before the Swedish issued the first European banknote in 19, in 19, sorry, in 1661. Uh, China released the first, uh, general circulated currency, um, in fact, it was during like the seventh century, um, and they had these copper coins, uh, which were being primarily um, China's currency at the time. But that currency is no longer still in use. So it might, it's not the first currency. The British pound, pound sterling is not the first currency. Let's not get mistaken, but it's just the oldest currency that's still now used. So like, think about like... It, it, it kind of, if you think about it in that sense, when the UK joined the EU and they fought so hard to keep the pound, it's kind of, you, you kind of understand it now more. Because if, when we joined the EU all those years ago and we had given up pound sterling, then it will, it would have been like an extinct currency. And we would be u- using euros now. And kind of thinking about on the flip side even more, how interesting would that be if we had given up pound sterling back in all those time or 50 years ago when we first joined the EU and we're now using euros now. <laughs> and then we left the EU. Would we have 
try to go back to pound sterling or would we still be using euros i don't know we never know because it never happened but interesting thought anyway and i i want to leave before i call this the end of the show uh because we've been talking about step and fetch i want to leave this kind of last thoughts kind of on the whole subject whereas although it's something that we will never know if he had played his character a different way tried to change it we'll never know of if he the character of step and fetch it would have still reached the same level of the same level of esteem had he had done it a different way we'll never know but what we do know is he did it that way it was controversial but it opened a lot of doors at the same time wrongly or rightly it brought us through to where we are now and possibly i saw this on a video but maybe this is the sense from all my research i found out like maybe if step in fetch it had changed with the times and evolved his character more maybe or maybe had different characters i don't know like maybe he could have stayed more relevant so that when he took his leave from hollywood in 1940 and came back in 1945 maybe he could have made more films um and worked more if he had figured out a way to change and develop this into more of something that was lessly criticized but we never know cuz we don't maybe it happened in an alternate universe <laughs> But anyway, like I said, I'll call this the end of the show and leave you with all my thoughts and for you to like kind of debate over and mull over and look more and deeper into Step and Fetch it and Lincoln Perry. Um, I think it's someone that more people should know about. And if you have enjoyed this episode, um, please follow us on social media at my opinion means um probably the best one is instagram i don't really use facebook but i'm, I'm trying i just uh, it's, it's it's just not the one anymore <laughs> um and check us out on youtube uh i'm going to try and post the videos that i post on instagram on youtube as well Let's see what that does <laughs> Uh but yeah um hope you've enjoyed this episode this has been episode 11 of the more you know mondays episode 12 will be out next week with uh, more interesting facts about interesting people or events hope you've enjoyed this episode and there will be more like more like <laughs> more next week <laughs> i'm messing up my words again so good thing it's the end of the show And thank you for listening and goodbye.